The warmest of greetings to you, and welcome to Happily Ever Teaching. This is the podcast to help you enthrall your learners in every subject under the sun using the best teaching method known to science, storytelling. To do this, we feature special guest educators who are passionately keen to empower your children. I am storyteller Chip Cahoon, and with me today is... Hi, I'm Helen, and I currently work with reception and year one children in Buckinghamshire. And I'm Nicola, and I currently work with year six children in Hampshire, and I've also spent time in my career hoping to motivate and inspire the next generation of teachers at Teacher Training College. And today we are planning lessons in geography and physical education with our dramatisation of the Great Fire of London. You can listen to the story by downloading our sister podcast, Fables and Fairy Tales, or search our website, epictales.co.uk, for Sir Tommy's Fire. There you'll find a video of me telling the story that you can share with your children. And if you sign up as an epic educator, you'll also get a copy as a paperback illustriously illuminated by comic book artist Dave Hingley, as well as the full audiobook for you to download at any time. Right now, though, let's continue our discussion with Helen, Nicola and Sir Tommy here. And we were just beginning to touch on the geography yesterday. There's there's always so much overlap, isn't there, between history and geography. Um, but we've mentioned maps already. Um, and Nicola, maybe we'll start at your end of the school uh, this time, just because you were the first to mention maps. So I think that means that you, you won. You win. <laughs> the... Yeah, you win. You this win the one. game. This one. <laughs> just this one. Yeah. The thing is, I'm okay not to win too, because I'm not going to be like Sir Tommy and blame anybody or... <laughs> I don't mind. <laughs> so yeah, what, what is your geography for ages 7 to 11? Well, maps is one part of it, and I have another part as well. So yes, looking at maps of London, navigating themselves around. I mean, going on a trip to London would be amazing, you know, if your school is close enough and, and getting the children themselves to navigate where they're at. I mean, the great thing as well nowadays, we've got Google Maps and Google Earth, and we can be in London very quickly with our little man on our screen showing us where we are going. So yes. we, we could actually yeah. do that. We could actually get the children to give directions and to navigate um, the places that were in the story mm -hmm. and find them. A bigger area for me with geography was weather and the wind had such a big yeah. impact. The fact that as soon as the wind died down, that the fire was able to be put out. We had that even recently, didn't we, in, in Europe with yes, fire yeah. raging because of, of higher temperatures and just how the weather can have such an impact on the environment and on the landscape, whether it's the man-made landscape mm -hmm. or the natural landscape. So I think the impact of weather could be a very big aspect of this thinking specifically about the story, but then going wider, thinking about wind, and then thinking about other natural disasters and other weather systems that affect the planet that we are on. Mm -hmm. It would be a good opportunity, wouldn't it, to, as you said, Nicholas, look at wildfires. And mm. there's places in the world where wildfires are incredibly damaging, and then to bring in sort of the role of climate change in that and the changes mm. that are happening to the earth. I mean, even where I live in the New Forest, we've got signs at this time of year where there's a high possibility of wildfires. Yeah. Yeah, goodness. And what do we do then to aid it if it happened? How do we how do we stop those fires? How do we manage it? And actually, what happens to the landscape when there is a fire? Because mm -hmm. I mean, it's going back to history a bit, but we're talking about Stone Age man hundreds of thousands of years ago actually used fire to clear landscape so that they could be safer from bison yes. and other animals that were coming to hunt them. So so yes, actually yeah. sometimes landscapes change and it helps man, but how does the weather affect that? It's such a big topic, isn't it? I mean, it's mm. a bit like some of the things you mentioned <laughs> earlier, Helen, you could spend a few hours on it, but you could spend easily a week, yes. if not two or three weeks yeah. on the effect of the weather and, and climate change and disasters and yeah. so on. It's interesting also just thinking from the point of view of this story about the impact that geography can have, because um, when I was writing this story, I obviously needed to know where Sir Thomas Bloodworth was in relation to Pudding Lane, because I knew that he um, got called to the scene. But it really took me aback to know that he was literally a street away. He was so close. I saw that and I hadn't, I hadn't realize that before I read yeah. your, your story. And of course, it makes you think, well, actually, how different could the story have been if the mayor's house was further away from Pudding Lane? Would they even have gone to get him? You know, maybe he 
is a scapegoat simply because he was the person of most authority who yeah. happened to live nearby. Just bad luck. Um, if, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It could just be really bad luck for him. But I guess that also means that you can then have conversations about location and proximity and, you know, the, the sorts of people who live in wildfire zones. Why mm. do they live there? What, what are the benefits or what are the reasons why they would end up in those sorts of areas? So plenty of interesting discussions to be had around this geography for certain. You could talk about the cost of living and how some people may maybe can't afford to live in certain areas. To live anywhere else, yeah. Make it very current. Indeed. What about the geography for ages four to seven, though, Helen? Well, I am going to similarly have a look at London with the children. There's a requirement for them to learn about what a village, a town and a city are. So that's a good place to start, I think. Mm-hmm. They look at the city of London, what makes it a city? And some of like talking about modern day at the moment, uh, what are the key features of London? You know, what, what are the landmarks? What's it, what's it like there? And the fact that it is the capital city, because again, in the UK, one of the requirements is for the children to learn the names of the countries of the UK and their capitals. So I thought that was a good place mm. to start. Let's learn about London, spend a bit of time. And once again, it's one of those things that could, could be a longer project, which is learning about London. And mm-hmm. either, as Nicholas said, visiting London or using all the wonderful technology we have now to look at different parts of London. Show yeah. children what Pudding Lane looks like now and and how it's changed. Maybe recreate London in, in a corner of your classroom or something like that. That would be wonderful, wouldn't it? Yes. <laughs> with all its features. You could create a 3D map. There you go. Yeah. Another map. You're doing well with yeah. maps today. I like it. Um, <laughs> I love that idea. I, I really like that idea. You could have a big... Um, big like piece of cardboard and the children build London on it. In fact, I haven't made a 3D map for a very long time in my classes. Excellent. I'm going to make sure I make one next academic year. Oh, there you go. Um, Brilliant. So you're making, making all the features and putting them where they actually would be ish in relation to each other. Yeah. So the children really learn about London. And this is a really easy one to do as well because 1666 London was mainly wood. Yes. So you've got um, a really easy comparison with, with all the cardboard houses that you could be building. You could almost make a map with the River Thames. And then half of it is built Mm -hmm. as 1666 London and half of it is built as modern day London. Wow. And then, you know, the comparison's right there. That's amazing. So there you go. Maps have gone further than than (laughs) I ever thought they could. And then um, linking to that, I thought it'd be interesting to look at the River Thames, actually, as a major river and what a river is, Mm -hmm. what a river is, what some of the major rivers are and, and what it is like as a habitat. You could bring in some of the interesting stories about things that have been found in the River Thames that shouldn't have been like the um, occasional get whales that are they're not where they're meant to be in dolphins. So I just thought that would be a, be a good introduction to the river, what a river is and the River Thames, especially because people, mm-hmm. you know, it features directly in the story, doesn't it? When people are trying to escape the fire. And yes, I think children yeah. find it interesting that the River Thames from all those years ago is still is still there. You know, we've still got well, the River yeah. Thames. It's one thing that, oh, well, has changed, but it hasn't changed as dramatically as the, the buildings of London. So. No, although um, rivers do change the landscape yes. as they move, don't they? And it would be interesting to see whether there has been a difference in the 400 years. Mm. Um, I imagine not, because they probably put quite a bit of concrete in to hold the shape by now. Yeah, I imagine they have. But seeing how it's sort of built up over time and then how London has built up around the river. Yes. No, you can think about ports then, couldn't you? And and obviously London's a oh, very important port yeah. and, and why some of our major cities were put where they were. Yes, and so on. Yeah. I suppose that could also be a, an opportunity to talk about why London wasn't really prepared for a massive great big fire as well, because they probably had other risks that they thought were more likely, more important, such as the river flooding. Mm. And of course, we are able to take this opportunity to give a sneak peek of what we're going to be talking about next week, um, our story all about water and rivers. You're you're going to be with us for that one, aren't you, Nicola? Yes, I am. Looking forward to it. And just let people know that that's coming up and you can tie this story with that story and that activity, all the activities we're going to be looking at next week. But for now, we're going to sneak a little bit of physical education into this episode episode because Nicola you had found something here for the physical education of your 7 to 11 year olds that's right I mean we, you mentioned earlier about the stop drop and roll obviously we could <laughs> do some <laughs> sort of nice well, nice warm up with that yeah I was thinking I had this vision of a ribbon dance 
and you could look at some videos of fire and the way it moves and create some oh, yes. I think quite a beautiful dance I've, I've done ribbon dancing you know have a pole with a ribbon on it maybe red and orange and yellow and and the children creating some group dancing and we talked about collaborating and not having to always work by yourself like so Tommy did yes. well mm-hmm. the children could work collaboratively in teams to to create a dance showing how fire moves yeah so that could be really beautiful couldn't i think it, with so the, too. the red and orange and yellow ribbons i think so and i don't think i think we need to give children the chance just to express themselves i know we we teach different mm. dances and this style yeah. and this style but actually you need to find some appropriate music but find some music and have a go at as i say creating perhaps the way it looks or maybe yeah. you could even start off with you know a small fire and it builds up with more children being together into a bigger fire like the fire of london like how it spread along yeah exactly. spread along the the houses yeah, yeah. yeah and you could actually dance this dance on your 3d map or through your 3d map <laughs> to show how it's a big yes. one it would have to be a big if you made the 3d map big enough you yes. certainly could yeah absolutely. yeah fill up your classroom or fill up your stage and dance to show the the spread of the fire of london there's probably yes. ways of using ict as well to have some images of the fire of london in the background and the children in the front of the camera and, and superimposing the images oh, definitely so i think yes we could go even one step further and make it look even more real definitely worth exploring your your, your young learners will throw themselves into that that'll be another one of those exciting enjoyable and therefore very memorable experiences definitely. i'm sure yes and look, we did manage to link them quite well didn't we mm. yeah i thought that was quite a smooth <laughs> link actually very good <laughs> That's all we have time for in this episode, folks. If you'd like to talk to us about anything you've heard in this podcast, or if there's a subject you are soon to teach that you'd like us to cover, you can find us on social media using at Teach Happily, or leave us a review using your favorite podcast app. Please also share this podcast with your colleagues and help us start a story-led revolution in classrooms around the world, so children everywhere can learn in a way that's effective, memorable, and enjoyable all at the same time. Tomorrow, Sir Tommy and the people of Restoration London will help us plan lessons in computing as well as design and technology. But right now, it only remains for us to say cheerio, and we hope to hear your story soon. So, cheerio, and we hope to hear your story soon. soon.